there's actually a separate resource. I can't even remember what it's called now, but it has over 5,000 pages of educational material. And included in that are about 2,000 pages of top projects of ABC students. Uh, master's degree students that become, uh, you know, what we choose every year, kind of the, the top ones, you know, the model projects. And so many of those are, are delivered through the website and well, actually, every issue of Van World Magazine. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer, and this is episode 48. Joining me is Max McKee. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening and for your support. I'd like to ask if you can help me in a couple of ways. I rely on word of mouth to spread the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Now, on to the episode. Hi, Max. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining me. I really appreciate you coming on the show. My pleasure. So, Max, can you introduce yourself for the listeners? My name is Max McKee, and uh, I have been teaching for the past 50 years. I live in Ashland, Oregon, where my wife and I raised a family of four children. What's your musical background, and so how do you get started in music? Uh, like so many, I got started as a young kid. My own father was a supervisor of music in a small town in Washington, Auburn, Washington, and uh, started taking band instruments and things. I started on clarinet. I was a terrible player and got some very fortunate things that happened along the way that allowed me to to go to the Gunnison Music Camp one year and changed my whole direction and became a pretty good clarinet player. And I went on to Washington State University, where not only did I run into another musical family, but I ran into my future father-in-law, who was the director of bands there, married his daughter a year and a half later, and uh, got uh, three degrees there, two bachelor's and a, and a master's degree, two in performance and clarinet, and the other one in education, and uh, moved to Southern Oregon University, which was called Southern Oregon College at the time, in Ashland, Oregon, and have been here in town, connected with the university for 30 years, but also doing other things since then. I see. So have you been the director of bands at Southern Oregon? I'd... Yes, I was. I was I the see. director from uh, 1967 to 1994. And uh, and then I wa- at that point, I saw the opportunity to build the American Band College, which is a separate nonprofit corporation, into something fairly dynamic. And so the president of the university allowed me to stay at home the last three years of my career at the university, even though I was still an employee there. Uh, in order to develop the American Band College. Oh, cool. We're going we're gonna to definitely touch on all of that. I want to ask about the Gunnison Music Camp. You mentioned that you, you had an experience there that set your course. What was that specifically? What happened there? Well, it was a very large music camp for many, many years. And uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the things that happened there, and I never realized it until many, many years later, because of my close relationship to Alan Gladys Wright, um, who also taught there for years, they said, you know, the things you're doing with all this, these things out on the West remind us of the Gunnison Music Camp. They had like a thousand students there, and they had several bands. They were conducted by the giants of the profession. Uh, Ravelli usually had the top band. Manelli had the second band. I think I was last year clarinet in his band um, that summer when I was an eighth grader. But uh, the place was a mecca of the world's greatest teachers, performers, conductors, Um, And they had uh, adult sessions as well as student sessions. My mother and father, both being musicians, sang in the the choir there that summer, and I played in the band. uh, But it was a really eye-opening experience, and so many of the things that they did there resonate with what we're now doing. Yeah, so um, let's talk about Wibbick and the American Band College and, and Band World. So you mentioned to me before I started to record that you founded Wibbick in 1979. Yeah, that's correct. And a lot of it just came out of the fact that I had been going for several years to the Midwest Clinic in Chicago, and uh, Alfred Reed kicked my tail and said, you need to get to this event. And I started doing that. And about five or six years later, I I was saying to a friend who had gone with me to the Midwest, I said, we really need to start something like that out on the West. And so in 79, uh, we started the Western National Band Clinic, which was a kind of a, a lookalike to the Midwest, but on a small scale and um, had all the same kinds of elements in it. And that went on in that way for several years and eventually started adding an honor band component to it, 
which by 1997 uh, was four honor bands um, from a thousand uh, students that that audition each year, and uh, and to make it really unique, the four honor bands were put together in a way that they would have six guest conductors, and each conductor would conduct one piece with all four bands, and also a major guest soloist. I see. And is that still the format today? Yeah, that format kind of solidified in about '97, and. Uh, so that's became the, the the route that we went. So we had that not as one of the functions, but it also was a director convention. So directors come and are participating in all kinds of clinic sessions and things like that. We have a director's reading band that plays for several hours uh, during the course of the convention. Uh, and my son, Scott, who is now running with it, um, five years ago added um, an intercollegiate honor band, and we have about 15 universities from which we select students as well. Mm -hmm. And now is it meant, and the the students for the honor bands and the university bands, that's only the Western region? Well, no. I mean, of course, it's strong Western just because of the cost of getting here. But I think this year we had 15 states plus Canada and Australia involved. We always have Australia involved. My son, Scott, created a really dynamic thing, uh, an interaction between us and festivals in Australia, starting that out with Ralph Hulkram, the composer. And uh, and now every year we send uh, 10 to 15 students to Australia, our top students that come out of WIBC. And they do the opposite with their festivals in Brisbane. Oh, that's great. That's great. So what were the challenges in those early years to, to set up the festival I mean, I, or the conference? I imagine it must have been been pretty daunting at that first <laughs> the first moments. Uh, money, money, and money. Uh, <laughs> and we didn't have any. And we started the first convention on a wing and a prayer, and we had a small exhibit hall of about 20 exhibits. And so that kind of gave us some... Uh, revenue, but that very year, the state of California pro- um, had a law go into place called Prop 13, which absolutely killed music and everything. Yeah. And it was that very year, so we had hardly anybody show up. So we thought we were dead, and uh, we left California for obvious reasons and moved up to Oregon and up to Portland for several years. The last 20 years, we've been in Seattle. Um, but the, the challenges there were that there just wasn't any money to to be used uh, from any source other than the exhibits that we had and the attendees that came. So it was, it was really tough putting that together to make it work. And uh, we uh, we actually, in 1985, about seven years in, had a monster snowstorm on the opening day of the, of the convention, and it looked like it was going to be canceled. And hundreds of people called and said, I can't get there. And, uh, the bands, most of them coming from other places where they have snow, said, ah, big deal, and drove in. And uh, so we still had a convention, but we were, my wife and I, who were funding this thing underground ourselves just to make it work, um, were in danger of losing about $150,000. Oh, my. Alfred Reed was there, and he said to me, well, at least you're incorporated. And I said, no, not really. We're just a nonprofit organization. He said, you realize you're going to lose your house if this happens? And and uh, he said, you need to get incorporated, which we did immediately thereafter. But the, the gratifying thing was is that all the directors who couldn't get there uh, that year uh, donated there the money that they had paid for registration, and we ended up losing only seven thousand dollars. Oh my! So what was the um, what was the breakthrough? When what happened to kind of put it on solid footing? And here we are in two thousand eighteen seventeen. Uh, several things. Uh, the exhibit hall was promoted tremendously by several leading people in the industry at about five years in, and we went from 20 exhibits to over 70 exhibits in one year. That was huge. And uh, and then in 1985, we, or 87, excuse me, we started uh, the first honor band, and I, I could just see that it was there was a way of doing that that was really quite unique. And so pretty quick we had two bands, and we had four or 500 students trying out. Then we decided to add a third band with kids from small schools, and the enrollment, the, the ad audition numbers jumped to over a thousand. And coupling that all together with having at that point now three hundred bands by 1987, that's eight years into our being, um, we were solid financially. And uh, another year added the fourth band, and that just the revenue that surrounds the whole band thing, plus the attending directors, really makes it work. However, with four bands now having five with our collegiate honor band. Uh, we had space problems and we got rid of exhibits. So that's where we differ from most other conventions. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. 
So if I'm a director, if I'm listening to this and I wanted to send some kids or I was looking to, to become more involved, how would I do that? What, what, what's the sort of the timeline for those sorts of things? Well, there's a you know very specific uh, registration uh, end dates uh, that come about in October, and uh, it's all online, and all of the materials and everything are through our website, which is at bandrule.org. Uh, there's two sets of audition materials. There's a, an easy set and a more complex set. The students can choose either. Obviously, there'll be some consideration given for placement based on what they choose, but that then allows students who are from small programs who had less training, all those kinds of things to feel like they can have some success with an audition. And uh, so we have about a thousand students that apply and then uh, and then we from that we put it together. And we don't do the typical kind of thing that you would expect with four bands. We don't go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I, I don't I mean we don't go all top band, next band, you know, down to the least experienced band. We take the top three hundred students and we put them equally in the top two bands and do the same thing with the next 300. So that way we have kind of a training uh, thing set up where students that are basically freshmen and sophomore play in the third and fourth bands. There'll be some seniors in there because of their experience and background. And the opposite is true as well. Some of the really tremendous young students make the top groups. But that allows us then to have a, a, a way of playing more difficult music with the top groups, the two top groups, and have them on a final concert together and have the other other groups uh, play an, uh, an earlier pair of concerts in that particular day. And with having all these composers and conductors and soloists involved in each one of those performances. Yeah, I imagine it makes it easier for literature selection also. Exactly. And, and you know, we, we've set up an absolute uh, range of difficulty that we expect uh, them to adhere to. And then what sometimes we'll say, I think you're going to find that's too difficult for the amount of rehearsal time you have, because basically each conductor has two one hour rehearsals uh, with each band and, uh, and then the performance on the third day. So after the foundation of Wibbeck and you said 1979, right. And the next thing that you added to the, to was band, the band world. Yeah, that came about as a result of the fact that in order to get Western National Band Clinic known, we were putting out a newspaper every year. And my father-in-law, who was the director of bands at Washington State, who I married, whose daughter I married, said to me, if you were to put out a magazine that had a lot of useful stuff in it, people would put it on their desk and leave it there. And, and so we started doing that. So in 1985, it became real obvious that we might be able to contribute uh, at the magazine level with a 50-page magazine that came out in that time five times a year. And we started doing that. And uh, so that's that. That's how um, Bandworld got to be uh, uh, an entity that was really based more on useful materials rather than things that are just uh, you know, kind of throw away. So you can look at things clear back to 1985 in that first year, and they're just as usable as everywhere because they're teaching tools. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. So I'm curious about, I mean, this is such a fascinating thing. I've, I have not been to the Western International Band Clinic as, uh, as you and I talked briefly, I'm, I'm sort of in a lot of ways kind of new, even though I'm old <laughs> to the band world. Um, and you know, I, I just sort of rejoined it a few years ago when I started writing music for band and have, have recaptured all that energy I had as a young person. So I've never been up there yet. And, um, it's, it sounds really interesting. What, what would I, what would I be looking forward to if I were to go next, next fall? Well, from the director's standpoint, you know, the, the nice thing is is that we we hire a, a large uh, staff of people who monitor the students. They all stay in the hotel, which has some real tremendous aspects to it. Uh, we monitor all the students. They go in groups of four. Uh, we send anybody home that's not told the mark. And uh, as a result, we have no problems. The hotel absolutely loves our event. And we put about 2,000 people in that hotel over you know, a period of time. And we're in a magnificent facility that has nine grand ball or nine ballrooms and uh, we use all of those all the time so we're not changing setups everything is set and you just go there and practice and the next thing comes in the room and that kind of stuff so as a director you go there you're not responsible for if you had students that you had that had made the honor band they're not responsible for you know, taking care of them in any way or form shape or form um, at the same time, the director is there and has a chance to go to clinics that are done by all of these people who are our guest conductors and soloists, as well as some others that we add on. And then we have uh, two 90-minute reading sessions 
um, of new music. And the way we do that is that every fall, we have all the publishers in the world send us all their new titles, and they send us a score and a recording. And uh, our staff listens to all of those and comes up with a top 100. We've been doing that now for about 20 years. And uh, we pick uh, about 50 of those pieces, and those are played by the director's bands with directors and, uh, that are attending, ones that have been around for a long time, uh, conducting those. They get their music a month in advance. And also we have the guest conductors who are directing the various high school honor bands and whatnot come in and do some of that sight reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just from as a composer, um, I'm really curious about that selection process. What 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 are the what is the staff looking for in those those pieces? What what sort of qualities jump out to you in a piece that goes on the top 100? Uh, first of all, it's somehow that it's you know it, it, obviously it's got to be a good composition. Uh, and we won't go there. I mean, there's so many things you can right, talk about, right, with that, sure. but you know, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious when something is <laughs> inferior. And uh, so, you know, out of the thousand pieces that come in every year, probably two, three hundred of them have no chance whatsoever of mm-hmm. being included. However, um, you know, there are a lot of things we're looking at. We're looking also at at a, a cross uh, section of grade levels and all that. Yep. So we're looking for high quality pieces that match grade levels. Um, and uh, try to come up with what we think are the best crop for that particular year in picking a crop under. It's just an opinion, but at least it's a way of getting some music out in front of people at WIBC. Yeah, absolutely. They, you know, they can play. And we do the same thing at the American Band College in the summer. We, we read even more pieces because we have uh, 200, 100-piece director's bands, and, uh, and they sight-read uh, music uh, for four days out of that, out of the several weeks that they're there. And that's all conducted by the master's candidates and assessed by video and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. I'm just curious because I, I had this conversation with, um, Jeff Gerard, who was a guest. He's uh, the band editor at, uh, Midwest sheet music in St. Louis. Right. Uh-huh. And we had a conversation about, about sort of how do you select these things? How do you make these judgments? I just find it interesting. Another one of my sons, who's been our computer programmer for the last 13 years, uh, has written a tremendous module based on the top 100. So if you go up to our website and go, you can find the uh, the top 100s, the Band World Top 100, and they are there for the last uh, 16 years, and it's a, it's a complete integrated engine. So you, if you want to look up, you know, grade two pieces by John O'Reilly, you can do that. Um, and it'll give you anything that he's ever had in the top 100 for the last 15 or 16 years. Yeah, no, it's a great list. It's a great list. All right, Max. So do you want to talk about the American band college? Sure. That, uh, that actually came out of my uh, undergraduate teaching. You know, I was a, I was a band director of bands at Southern Oregon college, now Southern Oregon university. And during that time, I, I got, I really understood personally, based on my background through my father-in-law and through other great teachers, and particularly all the great people that I was meeting and bringing into Western National Band Clinic, that the, the model for preparing band directors in the universities is really weak because you go in and you take a, a class in woodwind techniques, and if you're lucky, it's in a university where you might have two or three of those. Some mm-hmm. places you only have one and it lasts a term. Right. And uh, the, the standard old joke was, yeah, well, I, I'm definitely in good shape on bassoon and oboe. They showed us those instruments one day in class. <laughs> and uh, so I started to realize that, you know, a way to attack that would be to develop an undergraduate curriculum where I got rid of all methods classes and created a scheme by which every student um, would play in their first year in the program, this four-year program, four-year curriculum that came out as an undergraduate thing called the American Band College, they would um, they would play clarinet, trumpet, and snare drum for the entire year as a secondary instrument. And during the, that year, they played every Friday in a, a secondary instrument band, which was comprised of all the students in the program, about 20, plus about 25 or 30 middle school students from around the area who came in and became that band. And that band was always conducted by the students who were in that four-year program. When they got to be in the second, third, and fourth year, they were doing all the directing. That band would always present a little concert every year at a convocation. That I mean, every term they would do this. And so here was a chance to uh, get them doing something on their secondary instruments. But they also had, by the end of the year, they had to play a solo on that instrument. 
and they also had to teach a, a startup lesson that was graded. And I went to all the major music manufacturers at that time, and there were a lot around in those days, and I had 175 instruments that were loaned to me by major uh, music uh, manufacturer companies. And those were passed out to the students so that they had brand new clarinets, trumpets, snare drums, etc. And when they were in the second year, then they switched over and they did saxophone, they did trombone, and uh, timpani. In the third year, they moved on to, and so forth and so on. So by the end of the fourth year, they'd done everything, including trap set. And at the end, in the course of those four years, they played a, a simple solo on every instrument. They'd done a startup lesson on every instrument and played in the secondary band. They could choose which one of those three each week they wanted to play. Wow, that's impressive. So that that really started to work, and the and the thing just grew and grew and grew. And then I started adding elements to it that I thought were valuable for a director. In other words, you had to plan a tour, and you had to plan it down to the hour. And so if you were one of the students in there, I would say to you, okay, Mark, you're going to go out, and you're going to get uh, costs, bus costs from um, three bus companies. And I go on to another student, I'd say, you're going to go out, and you're going to get motel costs from three motels. And you're going to go out and you're going to get you know, pizza joint costs and so forth like that. And then you're also going to get a, you're going to figure out where you're going to go on your trip. You're going to map it out. You're going to figure out how to how many hours it's going to take you to get there. You know, just all the stuff we do in this business. And uh, if you for some reason didn't get the information that I'd asked you to get, uh, then the next day you had to write handwritten to all 20 members of the class because they were using your information to develop their own tours. You had to write them a, a handwritten apology. And uh, so, you know, all of it was at trying to build the whole band director scenario and get them into multitasking like we have to do. They also had every term a 90-minute cassette of standard band literature, and they had to know that and be, and be tested on it. And in order to make that happen, at the end of every term, we had a big major contest It was that was um, based around a evolving database and the four classes had a competition, and that led to a final winning class, and it also ended up with a final winning student who got a free tuition that the next term. So all those things kind of you know came together over about a seven or eight-year period. And then I realized my students were missing a key element, and that was they really needed the chance to learn how to run a program and, and to be involved in the administrative levels. So that's why I said, I think I'll start a workshop in the summer. Meanwhile, I had been using them on staff at Western International Band Clinic, so they were getting that element. But I wanted it to be more dynamic with the summer because the idea there would have been at that time was to come up with the idea of bringing in about 25 of the world's best teachers that covered every instrument and got everything down to a, a really high-end level of clinics that were leading you toward becoming a teacher of those instruments. And so by developing that whole scenario, uh, that became the beginning of what is now the American Band College master's degree program. But at that time, it was just a workshop. But my students were running it. And uh, over the several first several years, directors would come in and they would observe what, what our students knew as a result of being in this program. And they're going, holy cow, you guys need a master's program. So after in the fourth year, just by absolute coincidence, um, happened to be over at the airport picking up Tim Lotzenheiser, who was coming in. And uh, he, was, as I was waiting for him, the president of the university walked up and tapped me on the back and said, can I catch a ride back to Ashland with you? I've got to leave my car here for, for my son. Sure, no problem. So Tim hops in and he plays the straight man. And before we got back to Ashland, he had asked him, what about what's going on with this American Band College workshop? And Tim told him the detail of it. He says, you know what? You guys need a master's program based around this. And uh, he said, well, tell me how it works. So he told him how we brought in all these fantastic teachers and everything. He said, well, I'll tell you, this is really serendipitous. He said, "We um, two weeks ago, I was at a, a state meeting where I was promoting the idea of smaller schools having a chance to be able to develop master's programs, which was a no-no in the state at the time. And uh, he said, um, what I'd really like to, to do is to have you look at what, what I proposed to them, because I said, I, can, I want to develop an empty shell master's, and I want to be able to say, if you have a world-class faculty to fill it at your small university, you ought to be able to present that as a master's program using those people as your faculty. 
And he said, that's exactly what you have. I'll have that for you in three months because the state had not realized what it was they were approving. And uh, so in that, by 1992, it became a master's program, started with uh, three students. And uh, we're by now we have about uh, 220 actives and we graduate about 70 every summer, and uh, we'll have our 1,000th graduate next summer. So how many summers does it take to complete the master's program? It's a three-summer program, and uh, it has what I would call a language immersion component to it. L- uh, language immersion. It's high intensity in our city for, th- for uh, three weeks. And so, you know, the, the joke has always been, well, you get your master's degree from from ABC in three weeks, and uh, but <laughs> you have you have to understand what goes on here. I've told you some of the components that were in the undergraduate program; those are on steroids with the master's program. And uh, so, all the students do six major uh, thesis type projects during their three summers, and they do those after they leave here, and after those eighteen days. But they devise three of those programs; they devise themselves based on a five-hour entrance exam they have when they come to ABC. Right. And that that five-hour entrance exam has three hours of band-related material and two hours of music theory. And from that, by the second day, we have a complete lineup of what the student knows and doesn't know. And there are cutoff points in there, and so we might say, you appear to have these 12 weak areas, or another student, you have these eight weak areas. Yours are different than mine. And that's the real key to ABC, and that is is that every student is on his own channel in terms of study and what they do in terms of projects. So in the the weak areas, they have to develop three projects that are called practical applications that they develop from areas in which they have very little knowledge. And uh, therefore, over the course of the three years, they really develop those areas, and they develop these high-end which I say to them, if you don't want, to, if you can't put this on a shelf in a bookstore, I don't want to see it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, and then they do three other projects, which are based around conducting, heavily around conducting. The, the first one of which is they bring us a recording of their own band, and we put those together with several other bands, and each student goes off after they finish here in the three weeks, and they do contest judging of their own band and several other bands. And they do voiceovers and they do uh, written materials on what that band can do to improve and so forth and so on. In the second year, they actually do a three-part process, uh, which is based on doing a sight reading with their own band, midpoint rehearsals, and a final public performance. And all the materials they build to teach that piece and what they do to problem solve it and all that kind of stuff. And then their final project is they, they select out their top 30 pieces that they've heard here, over 400 in the course of the three summers, uh, they pick out their top 30, and they also pick out their top 20 clinics that they've been in, they've seen, and they see 70 every summer. And uh, so they, they pick their top ones, and uh, they create a book that becomes their tome for future use. It's an impressive program. Thank you. Well, it's it's been, uh, you know, it's been a tremendous work in progress over the years, and uh, it's real strength totally is based around the fact that it's it is a legitimate hard big big time family yeah you can imagine what happens here when you have people who are all trying to learn bassoon fingerings i mean most of them out of this we'll have 75 new students every year and i would say at least 40 or 50 of them will always have bassoon on their list of things that they're just not good at and So what happens is that we tell them, bring those instruments that you can't play, and then you can get together with a good bassoon player or and the bassoon teacher who's in here as our clinician, because we always have a bassoon clinician. We always have an oboe. We always have at least two percussion, trumpet, trombone, da-da-da-da, you know, down the line. And uh, you'll have a chance to do that. So you'll see these little clatches of 15, 20 people that are over here in the corner playing bassoon duets and things like that as a way of getting after the instrument. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the real strengths here is that there's so much of that interplay between the students and their own expertise. A flute player might w- walk over to a trombone player and say, man, I just don't know anything about alternate alternate positions on trombone. Can you help me? Sure. And so you know that one of the good trombone players gets together with that person. And that goes on here very, very big time throughout the whole three weeks. Yeah, I have a couple of things I want to ask you about here <laughs> based on all that. Um, the first, I guess I should probably address the, the the question about your partnership with Sam Houston State. Yeah, we originally were the first 20 years, we were with Southern Oregon University where I taught. 
and uh, then we could not come to an agreement financially in uh, 2010. Uh, there was a lot of empire building going on at that school at that time, and it looked like our students were going to be charged way too much money to get this degree. And uh, so at that time, Mike Bankhead was the chairman of the department there and a close friend, you know, former U.S. Air Force band conductor and tremendous friend. And uh, so we uh, we moved over there and, and became part of their school. So we uh, the master's degree program is housed by and it's their curriculum that's been developed in conjunction with what we do. American Band College is a separate nonprofit entity. It's not a school, but the degree itself is hooked to that, and Sam Houston State University hosts that degree. Our students do not go to Sam Houston State University because all of their uh, work with each other is done here during that three-week period each summer. Right. Yeah, you know, interesting that you bring up Mike Bankhead. I am actually a graduate of Chico State. Oh, all right. So and, were you there at the time? <laughs> well, I was there from 1989, and I finished my degree in 1993. And then I was there for one year before I left to get my master's at the University of Colorado. I was there kind of getting a portfolio and composition together because I was a music ed undergrad. And um, Mike came in the fall after I left, and I only met him very briefly during when he came to interview. Okay. That was like in 94? That was like the spring of 94, and I think he took the job in the fall of 94. Oh, is that weird? Because, see, I knew about him and had met him several times at the Midwest and all that, but I was doing a keynote speech at a Northern California uh, educators convention, an MENC convention, and Mike was there doing lectures on conducting. And so I thought, i got to go hear this guy. So I did, and I just fell in love with what he had to offer. And uh, that was in 94. <laughs> Max, I'm noticing one of the things that's a kind of a common thread through both your teaching at Southern Oregon and the American Band College is your, your belief in experiential learning. Yeah, I think it's, to me, it's the most critical. And I, I, I was lucky that my own family, my father was a band director, my mother was a church organist. Uh, I had a lot of hands-on stuff when I was a kid. But more importantly, when I got with my father-in-law, Randall Spicer at Washington State University, um, I just, I didn't even know what I was seeing for a long time, you know, but, but it was that. It was just, everything was based on that. He, for example, had every Friday afternoon, he had a think tank and anybody, any student could go there. And I, I married his daughter when we were sophomores in college and she and I went to the think tanks every Friday and we would put our two cents worth in and there'd be many other students there. And Randy would use that as a way of showing people how to, how to work together as a team because somebody would say, well, that's a stupid idea when we're talking about ideas for halftime shows where it was. And he would say, wait, there are no stupid ideas. What you have to think about is the fact that somebody will come up with some wild concept that might not make any sense to you, but you might be able to take a little hunk and piece of that and plug it into something that will be really dynamic. And so he did all that all the time. And I just, I, I was amazed by it. And so when I started to see what I wanted to do with the undergraduate program of ABC, I knew that it had to get the students so directly involved that they they would never miss a class. They wouldn't even think about missing a class. In the whole, all the years I ran that there, I lost one student. He was a student who just didn't get it and turned out to be a terrible band director and quit the business after two years. Um, because the other students found out right away that that it wasn't busy work to plan a tour. It, it was not busy work to do, um, to have to sit down and figure out some, uh, let's say, um, excerpts from band pieces that could be really interesting training exercise for the band or based around certain concepts that were in that particular piece. You know, all that kind of stuff just started boiling as part of ABC all the time. Yeah, it sounds like a tremendous program. I'll, I'll be certain to link all of the links and, um, you know, to make sure that everyone gets that information that they need. I, yeah, I should mention when you talk about links, because there are there's a raft of free tools at our website. There are some things that are not. We have an engine, by the way, that's called Ultimate Pursuit. And my oldest son, Randy, uh, who's been with this programming since 2005, wrote this engine. And it has thousands and thousands of questions in it that, have all, that are all built around what happens with our master's degree students. So, for example, if you had 10 week areas that you're doing, uh, then you would have a certain guidance to say you need to do X number of questions per month using the Ultimate Pursuit database. And that's all tracked in terms of your improvement. 
and um, and the feedback. And every question has feedback. So, for example, if you're working on transposition and you transpose the wrong direction, the engine knows that. So right away it shows you things that will make you understand why clarinets don't transpose up a step or down a step to play the note, but the opposite, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, so that engine is used now in connection with all the master's degree candidates, and they get monthly feedback charts that show exactly where they are in each area of the things they're studying. And that one we don't make public, but there are some very, very powerful public ones. There's one called the Partial Worker, and uh, it came because of my relationship with Clarence Sawhill and uh, Russ Howland, who was at Fresno State. And they were both really big in the whole thing about using the Overtone series as a tool for teaching and understanding all of its uh, things that it delivers. And I found out over the years that hardly anybody actually teaches it or uses it in any fashion. And I got the, I went to a lecture. My father-in-law said to me, um, Russ Howland is giving a lecture at this MENC. I want you to go hear him. And he got a 10-minute standing ovation for a lecture on the Overtone series because he explained what it was about. Well, you don't get out of ABC without command. You have to know every fingering on every instrument. You have to know all the alternates. You have to know all the pitch problems. You also need to know all the things that go into what the Overtone series delivers to you if you want to be a decent arranger, for example, or a composer, but especially a arranger. Figure out where things are and what, why the spacing is like it is and all that kind of stuff. And so that became one of the, the central tools of the American Band College. Well, that, that tool, it's called the Partial Worker, play on words, uh, teaches you how to build Overtone series and understands the, the intervals and, the, and also has all the things with pitch and everything else. All right, Max, I'm going to kind of get us to our, my final group of questions, sort of the ones I ask everybody. And, um, that's where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? Well, of course, my, my relationship to a lot of that kind of thing is from a different view in general. Um, as it turned out as a 24 year old kid, I came to Southern Oregon college to uh, start a marching band. And I did that, and the year, the day I arrived, the guy who was the director of bands left, and I ended up with a whole program at the age 24. And uh, I didn't really have a, a clue about what I was doing, but you know, I started figuring out that the most important thing I could do was to link up with really, really good teachers in the public schools and all that. And I actually did some uh, local teaching over the years. I, I directed, uh, co-directed the Ashland High School Band for a couple of years, and. Um, a lot of different, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of out and about stuff in school programs and doing festivals and, and uh, summer programs and things like, like that. So it, it, because of that, my it was really important for me in order to get a handle on what, what students needed in public school programs at that age level. I, I really needed to study that. And uh, so ABC always brought in top long long-time top teachers. And so the thing that I noticed so much about the whole competition bit is that uh, I think it gets out of hand when you when you go to the point where all you're doing is spending your year preparing your marching band program. I mean, that's an extreme, but there are places where that happens. And if not, there are some pretty extreme examples that are even based on just a few months of contact. So from my personal standpoint, it just seems to me that there there is a logic to trying to level the playing field in terms of what a band program should deliver to the students and to the community. Max, what harder lessons do you want to share as, as far as being a conductor and an educator? Oh, yes. I, I got my tail kicked <laughs> in a really uh, big-time way right from the time I was in the eighth grade. I was playing at a solo and ensemble contest up in western Washington, and uh, the contest judge was a director about 20 miles away from where my dad was the director of bands. And after I played, he walked over to my dad and he said, can your t- the son take some heat? I was playing clarinet in the solo, eighth grade. He said, oh yeah, he's a Brazilian kid. So he came up and he said, son, that's probably the worst clarinet playing I've ever heard in my life. And I'd suggest you either take lessons or go do something else because you're wasting your time and you're certainly wasting our ears. And uh, I was really taken back by it, of course, for about 12 seconds. And uh, that's what that was the thing that I ended up starting lessons with a tremendous clarinet teacher the next year. But I also went to the Gunnison Music Camp that summer. So that that was the first one. And uh, then after I had had the job here years later at at Southern College, I 
I realized I was not doing a good job at the concert band level, even though I had been around one of the finest concert band people in the world, my father-in-law. And I didn't know it at the time, but the reason I didn't do well is because his teaching was based almost exclusively around teaching balance and blend. And he used that to teach intonation. He used that for everything. And that is a really hard concept unless you're steeped in good tools. So that summer of my second year here, I just realized I was, I just, I wasn't cut. It was just, the band was not good at the concert band level. My marching band was really solid, but so I, I just happened to be the woodwind guy for Clarence Sawhill, who was at UCLA for many years. And he was doing a, a thing here in town uh, called the Siskiyou Band Camp. And I was his woodwind guy. And I told him my story about what I just told you. And he said, um, bring me all the music you plan to do with your small college band and let's look look through it and make some decisions. And so he went down each one. He said, well, that one's not going to work. You've told me you don't have any personnel that'll make that one work. Uh, this one's going to be way too hard and just in terms of the difficulty of the various lines and the woodwinds, blah, 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 blah. And he got it down to about six, seven pieces. And he said, okay, here's a box of colored pencils. He said, uh, I want you to use blue to mark any note that's flat. Here's my brand new book, which came out that week, by the way. It was the first book on intonation tendencies back in the 60s. And uh, he said, here's a copy of my book. And he said, I want you to look at every note that's going to be typically flat on an instrument. I want you to mark that in blue. And if it's a sharp note, you mark it in red. You use orange for the issue, green for this, and so forth and so on and so on. And you're looking for different kinds of things. You're looking for timbre. You're looking for releases. You're looking for, you know, just problems in the music. And he explained all that to me. And he said, you work on that. So every night I'm up till 3 a.m. working on these scores and learning all these intonation things and all of that. And at the end of the three weeks, he said, well, we should, he had told me, he said, we should get together. And I walked to, I said, Clarence, we haven't, we haven't gotten together yet over the stuff I've been working on. And I have been doing it every night for four or five hours. He said, do we need to? <laughs> and I thought about it for a minute. And I went, no, you know, I'm looking at the scores. I see the war zones. He said, yeah, just go rehearse the war zones. Any place where you got color, you got to fix it. Ignore everything else. And uh, it was the single greatest lesson I ever had. And I turned my band program around within a year at the university. And after I had done the, what I call the Clarence Sawhill toolbox approach to teaching, where you're learning all the little itty bitty tools. After I had done that for five years, all of a sudden one day I just went into my brain and went, oh, I see what Brandy does. And that's when I switched over the other direction, which was to teach everything from the standpoint of balance and blend. And I now have a toolbox. So ABC, by the way, is a toolbox. Uh, one of my students, uh, um, who was a long, long time mechanic um, for the Long Beach um, Police Department, motorcycle mechanic, came to me at age 40 and said, I've decided I'm retiring from my job down there. And I want to become a band director. What do you think? I said, well, if you want to work hard at it, you can do it at undergraduate level. And as as we went along and we were developing the American Band College program simultaneously that he was doing this, he came to me one day and he says, you know, what you were doing with this reminds me of what, what my father did for me that made me a great mechanic. When I was 14 years old, he gave me a little toolbox, a little tiny one. It was about 10 inches long. It had a hammer, a screwdriver, and a pair of pliers. And he said, I want you to master these three tools. And I had to do that for the next six months. And then on my birthday, he gave me one that was a little bit bigger, and he added in some socket wrenches and so forth and so on. He said, that's what the American Band College is. It's, he said, when I was a senior in high school, he gave me this great big thing on wheels with four drawers and every tool you could imagine. And he said, that's what ABC does. You develop toolboxes. All right, Max. So this is a question that it doesn't sound like you, maybe you haven't quite found the answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of those. <laughs> but how do you find work-life balance in your career? Uh, didn't do it well for quite a long time when I was, uh, you know, young. And uh, my wife and I had these four kids who are, I would say, some of, four of the top human beings on the planet. <laughs> and uh, most of that didn't happen because of me. Uh, I was always real supportive of my kids and I always did their events and all that, but they had, you know, a mom who was taking care of most of the taking care. And, uh, because I was just, I was doing way, way too many things. And I, I got some, some good wake up calls with uh, some problems that I had with having so many groups I was conducting and right in the middle of a concert, I couldn't remember what, where the downbeat was. And, uh, 
that that was my first lesson in that. So uh, we talk about that a lot with American Band College students. We always try to have people here doing clinics and whatnot on that very facet of how you make sure you don't lose it. And I just so lucky because my wife had been around all this crazy stuff with her own father, so she's stuck with me now for 56 years. And, uh, and you know, we just, we've had a tremendous experience. But I, I think it's important to, uh, the biggest life learning one there was from my wife. I'd come back from doing a, a couple of weeks down in Australia. This is where I met Ralph Ultra in the year they had the World's Fair down there. And I'd gone down to do a band world story. And uh, when I came back, I said, oh, man, you gotta you can't believe what's going on in Australia. There's this and that and that. And I started going down the list. She said, stop, that isn't. And never will be part of my life. So there's no sense talking about it. And there hasn't been a day since where she hasn't traveled with me. Uh huh. Uh huh. And uh, so that was probably one of the most important things I ever did because it also made me recognize some other things that I needed to do even more with my own kids. And I've been really fortunate because my my oldest son is our full time programmer. My youngest son is now the CEO. My daughter has been on our uh, Webbing staff for over 20 years. And my other son was on staff at Wibbick for a lot of years as well. He's a banker now. But uh, anyway, yeah, uh, there has to be some. And if you don't, you're going to lose it. And uh, I talk to the, I see the young guys out there now, some really people that are doing fantastic things. I'll say, take your wife with you. Somehow take your wife with you. It doesn't matter if you make money doing that. Yeah. You have a real job. That isn't going out doing sessions. It's not your living. That's just your experiential stuff. All right. So this is another big question. And this is the one, um, get lots of answers here. And so what are the challenges that are facing music and music education as we move forward to the 21st century? Well, you know, this, this is, again, a thing that we've been able to really cover a lot because we have so many grads now. We've, we've got uh, graduates from ABC from all 50 states and 16 foreign countries. So we've got a lot of viewpoints. And uh, uh I think to me that the main one is that I hear the most is that music programs get into serious trouble in a lot of areas the fewer classes that are taught in the daily schedule of the public school. In other words, if you used to have eight periods, uh, music always survived well. If you only had four blocks or five periods or six periods, it got tougher and tougher to carve out space. And... Uh, I'm not sure there's much that the band director can do about that, but a lot of them do talk to it and how it's impossible to have, you know, really successful, useful rehearsals if you're on a four block type thing where you have two or two and a half hours of rehearsal at the same, you know, in the same period and that kind of thing. So, I mean, that's one. And then, and then I just, to me, it comes back to probably the most important thing of all is, you know, you, you look at, We've seen this over and over. All of us have seen it where you have this tremendous program that's got 150 students in it. That guy leaves. The next person comes in who's young and inexperienced and just doesn't have all the stuff aligned. And that program drops down to 25 or 30 students in a couple of years. And so I think, and I, and I really, really emphasize this through the ABC master's program that you've, you've got to figure out how to present yourself in a way that you keep your students interested and that they understand that you're looking out for them as people more than you're looking out for them as the players of certain instruments. Yeah, it's a good answer. All right. So I asked you about your hard earned lesson. This is a different question. What advice would you give your 20 year old self? (laughs) (laughs) Oh boy. (laughs) My 20 year old self. Um, Actually uh, I did, I did get a lot of things that that got me on right track, and this again is see. I think this. I think mentoring is so incredibly important because if you've got people who are watching you succeed and fail, usually more of the failure side, they they will give you good heads up. I got so lucky. I was 22 at the time, so it's close to what you're talking about. And my father-in-law gave me the second band to conduct because I was directing the marching band as, a gra- as his graduate student. And uh, he gave me the second band. And one day, and that was meeting at the same time as the first band. And one day they, they were off doing something else. So he came to my rehearsal. And afterwards he said, come and see me after rehearsal. And uh, so I got in there and he, did, he was just kind of seemingly distracted doing something and just waiting for me to chime in. And finally, after it was com- 
completely silent for about five minutes. I said, well, you know, they have a lot of problems. And he said, he turned around in his swivel chair and he turned around and he said, no, actually you have a lot of problems. That was kind of a, that was a huge thing for me because it made me realize how important it was, what the role that this guy was playing for me. And he did that his whole career. Um, an example was that when he retired, the new guy came in to Washington State University and Randy went to the, he knew the guy was going to have his first rehearsal in the concert hall in the, where the whole hall was dark. And he's just up there playing some stuff through, you know, just to see what the band's selling. So he picks, does the, the holst and um, the first and Sweden. And so Randy's sitting out there. He came in to sit down and just listen. And at the end, he turns on the light to see if any kids had left any instruments or stuff out in the audience. And he saw him. He says, Randy, how come you didn't come up? I would have had you introduced you to the band today. He says, no, it's your program now. And he said, oh, well, thank you. I'm sure glad you came. So do you have any suggestions? He says, oh, not really. And they were starting to walk out. And remember, if you remember Columbo from the television days, that always happened. He'd be, do you have any thoughts or whatever? No, not really. He turns around. He says, there is one thing. When they play the first five notes, just have them drag the first two notes. And the whole thing being that, you know, not that they were going to play too slow, but that they were not going to rush the do 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 figure. And uh, anyway, those kinds of examples came out over and over and over in my life with him as a whole business of mentoring. And I, to me, that's probably the, the most important thing that going forward that we can do for students is figure out better ways to mentor yeah, and teach. Yeah, I agree. That comes up a lot, too. That's a common advice on the show, for sure. Is it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm glad. I just It's hard to do anything about it sometimes, yeah. but... Well, we all are responsible for doing it. You know, we have to take it on. Yeah, and we we'll, we'll seek them out if we're young. You know, whatever that role is. I just look at the guys that that do that on steroids, and and they do it in spite of all the other busy things in your life. Tim Lotznider is one of the best. You know, they just they'll show up anytime, any place to do anything for anybody that they can, and hopefully it'll make a difference. Well, I think it's true. You know, one of the things I, I I've been coming to terms with is you know I mentioned earlier on that I'm kind of back to the band community. You know, I'm in my mid forties. I'm mid career. I have a doctorate in music, but yet I still need a mentor and I in turn can mentor others with what I know. And so we're yeah. all in a continuum. It is. And that, what that statement you made right there is one of the most important. I think that I see daily at ABC is that you have people with tremendous background working with people with no background in something they want to know and they're going to share. And then they find out that it's a two way street. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I don't know, there, there's something there that, that says that we need to do a better job of directing traffic with people, like my being on, almost always on the teaching side of this. Uh, we need to direct traffic better with students that are coming through programs, and I got very lucky. It was around a lot of people that did that. And I, You know, the people like Ray Kramer and uh, Frank Wicks and uh, just so many great ones in the business. If, if you listen to them, that's one of the things they always did was to try to try to really help their students in ways that are not obvious so much to the music side as they are to the being a good human being and doing the right things. All right, Max, my last big question. If you had a choice, what would the final work for Wind Ensemble or Band that you would conduct be? Irish Tune from County Dairy. It's a tune that came to me in a very different way than than a lot of other pieces. I had heard it many times when I was young and thought it was a stupid piece. <laughs> the band, the band, the Granger. And then, uh, I, like it's like yesterday, I remember, this was at a WIBC, and uh, uh, Birch Pace's group, his Navy band, played it. And I just, when it was done, I went, oh my Lord, the stuff that's going on in that piece that hardly anybody ever expresses, I've got to learn how to do that. Well, I'm Irish by background, and... In 1988, I made my first of 10 trips to Ireland, and uh, and I found out the the reason that that piece can be really terrible or it can be really fantastic. And so, you know, when I conduct it, I think of as, as though I'm a person sitting on a little hillside in Ireland, and I'm singing the song, and I don't give it a whit about time. It doesn't matter if I take an extra two seconds between phrases. That's extreme, but you know what I mean. It, it's it's a person that's just expressing themselves, and that's what I want to do with it. And so every time I've ever conducted, when I when we we hosted the the American Bandmasters Association National Convention here in 1988 
in Ashland. And uh, they have a tradition that you only conduct one piece with your band if your band is playing at the convention. And since we were the host, I was doing that. So I had eight guest conductors, and the only thing I directed was the Irish tune from County Derry. And uh, I would do that any chance I get. Is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Uh, a concept, which is something that we just stumbled into a year ago, and I think it's one of the best things we've ever done. As you can imagine, with an event now that's coming up 40th year, Western National Band Clinic, and parallels other similar events, whether it's the Midwest Convention or uh, any MENC, Allstate or Northwest or whatever, um, it's always it's always really been a challenge to get uh, people to attend the convention because there are some pretty stringent rules, you know, that that are uh, in place with MENC related stuff. I know it's naff me now, but I'm old school, um, and. I think one of the, the things that, that I experienced the most was is that a lot of times directors had to make a decision on whether or not they could go to WIBC or whether they would go to the MENC event because if they had a student in the Allstate band, they had to be members and they had to attend and so forth and so on. And we weren't fighting that, and I definitely wasn't going to try to you know go loggerheads and require people to do whatever with WIBC. But the new concept that we're now doing, which I think is really, really successful, is that when students apply for our event, the directors will get, for every student who applies, they'll get a $5 donation to their band fund. So if you've got 20, let's say, uh, well, we'll take a larger number here. Let's say you've got 30 kids who are applying. So that's $150. It'll come back to the band program as a specific amount that the fund earns, not the director, but the band fund. And for every one of those 30 students that makes it and is a member of one of the honor bands at WIBC, if the director attends the convention, they get $30 per student for their band fund. And that we started that this last year, and several schools made over $1,000. So, you know, that, that to me is um, something that's really powerful and it's starting to have an impact because the, the directors are getting more students to apply and they get the $5 because they kind of help their kids through the audition process. That's the thing that we ask them to do to get that $5 for their band program back from the audition. And uh, so I, I just I think that's that's going to be really, really good going down the road. Beyond that, um, our ABC program is really flourishing. We expect probably 200 plus again this summer. And we've got an amazing lineup of uh, guest conductors and solos. For the first week, we have uh, actually have three guest solos. We have Harry Waters on trombone. Uh, we have Bobby Shue on trumpet and uh, Julian Bliss on clarinet. And Julian is the main feature performer, but they're going to do a bunch of stuff together. And Mike Davis, former U.S. Uh, Air Force Band arranger, is doing a great big premiere piece for the three of them that will end the concert. And the second week, uh, we had these tremendous vocalists signed up, and darn if they weren't going to have a baby a week after ABC, and we lost them a week ago. So we're gonna, instead, we're going to have Canadian brass. Not a bad backup. <laughs> that's what we thought. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's great. That's on the list of things happening coming up soon. Yeah, no, I'm, I was looking at the the list earlier. You've got a lot of great people involved. You know, some of the the great names in our field. Yeah, you know, it's and it's so fun, and and they are like a big family. We, I don't know if you know, but we host an event at the Midwest. If you're there, you should come and just check it out. We host an event which is for American Band College graduates and even people that they're trying to recruit to come. And we take over Kitty O'Shea's at the Hilton in downtown Chicago uh, on Thursday afternoon for two hours, and we buy all the food and drinks and everything. And we have nearly 200 of our ABC grads and students show up. And all the you know, Canadian brass would show up, Boston brass would show up, Jim Walker, the great flute player. I don't care who it is. They all love it because it's the, it's the ABC family getting together. Well, Max, thank you so much for your time. Great talking with you, and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.